Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another uh, Facebook Live, live program, virtual program with the Walters Art Museum. Uh, tonight, we have a very special program in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, and we'll be talking about Mayan languages and their teaching in Guatemala. Uh, we have two very special guests here, um, and I'm really happy to be speaking with them. Um, but before we get started, my name is Ellen Hubler. I am the William B. Ziff Jr. Associate Curator of the Art of the Americas here at the Walters. And uh, in keeping with Indigenous Peoples Day, I would like to recognize myself, the original stewards of the land on which the city of Baltimore and subsequently the museum was created. The Walters Art Museum exists on the unceded ancestral lands of the Susquehannock and Piscataway nations, as well as the home territory of the Lumbee and Cherokee peoples today. So we honor them today. I'm really delighted to introduce today's speakers and I will introduce them in order of uh, their presentation. Uh, we have with us today two very exciting academics who combine both the um, academic, esoteric, and intellectual with the practical. Very exciting. Um, so first we have Pedro Mateo Pedro, an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Toronto and the executive director of the Guatemala Field Station at the University of Maryland, which we're gonna hear a bit more about. Oops, sorry about that. Um, a native speech speaker of Canjobal, a Mayan language of Guatemala, which we'll hear him speaking in just a little bit. Mateo Pedro's research focuses on the documentation and description of Mayan languages, specifically language acquisition. Uh, as well as Mayan languages in contact and dialectic, dialectal variation. His documentation projects on Mayan languages have been a collaborative effort with mentors and colleagues from many different universities, such as the University of Kansas, University of Maryland, McGill University, and Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. Mateo Pedro received his PhD in linguistics at the University of Kansas and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. He has taught at universities in, in Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States, and was recently a visiting scholar at the Lenguas y Letras of the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro in Mexico. He has also taught courses on Mayan and linguistics in many different within Guatemala. Welcome, Pedro. And Maria, or Masha Polinski, received her doctorate in linguistics in 1986. She has taught at the University of Southern California, the University of California, San Diego, and Harvard, I'm sorry, the University of California, San Diego, and Harvard University, and is now a professor at the University of Maryland. She specializes in linguistic theory and has done extensive work on endangered languages in different locations around the world as well as on heritage language speakers, a group which includes more than 50 million Americans today. At the University of Maryland, Polinski's work includes research on a wide array of languages from Austronesian and Mayan languages, as well as languages of the Caucasus. She is a pioneer in bringing both the tools and the research questions of lab-based psycholinguistics to speakers of understudied languages. And I wanna welcome both of you so much today. And we're so excited to hear more about your work together on the in the Guatemala field station, the Maya language field station within Guatemala, part of the University of Maryland's uh, program in linguistics. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. Wow. Trajin de gemas anil. Ayin don chiwik luin mat. Pedro Mateo Pedro. Es chikai, es mamin, es wana, es rustak, es kopo, es ache, es unin, es wina junin, es unin, cha kuns kawilikul. Kawal chitsalo kim pishan wahi eke yut yut hun yai kualilti. Watch one chin kahabe yut shin yiban ep hit konop mayap ashkaton a spape alep. Al Yaira Lip should Halan Shin Matsetal Cheto, Hipalem, but Set Cheto Hip and Yedoke Char Shinun's Kaule Kul Kash a Chalka Basha Estol Atainek by Totalip Head Conop by Canada 
kastol salok abashim pishan wa and khuns kaulik ul kaiti good evening good afternoon uh, my name is pedro mateo and what i uh, said was in kanhubal a greeting in kanhubal and you see the translation in the uh, slide i'm not going to read the translation but what i said basically what is there and also i wanted to acknowledge the land where i'm at this moment the land of indigenous people in toronto canada where i am uh, currently working so i'm going to start uh, with the following slides about uh, mayan language and mayan culture so one thing that i want to mention is that uh, Mayan culture, uh, it's part of the Mesoamerican area where we know that there are many uh, cultures, many languages that are spoken and with uh, diverse diversity of languages, diversity of culture. And even though there are many policies on the countries about the, uh, these cultures, these cultures and these uh, languages and their speakers are, uh, I mean, still live in this uh, place. So in the following slide, please. So I think I uh, said part of this slide, but I want to mention some uh, cultural and linguistic characteristics that uh, people have found in the uh, Mesoamerican area. One of them is the numeral system is 20 by 20. So we are, uh, we know, or we have been taught in schools that the uh, this decimal system, for example, the 10 by 10, so 10, 20, 30. But in the Mayan culture, for example, or in the Mesoamerican culture, like 20 by 20, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100, for example. So that's one thing. The other thing is about some linguistic properties, for example. So there is when we talk about the nominal possession or when a speaker possess a noun, for example. So there is this construct like the man's dog. But it's like saying the dog's man, for example, when you do a literal translation. The other thing is what is called relational nouns. For example, uh, when we talk about human, a human body, for example, human uh, being, for example, that human being has head, has ears, has uh, all kind of parts, for example. So it's kind of the thing that we see also in 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 objects in in, in like uh, what we see like in this example, shikinte na, literally meaning the ear of the house. So that house has a ear, has an ear, for example, but basically it means the corner of the house. So that's the basic idea of relational noun, for example. The other thing that it's important to mention here is that these languages, or in this case, Mayan, indigenous languages or Mayan languages, for example, are called verb initial languages. The main idea is that there is that the verb comes first and then the rest. For example, here, the man saw the dog. So if putting that in English, for example, we'll say something like, saw the man, the dog, something like that. So in the following slide, I would like to talk about uh, what the contribution uh, more precisely of the Mayan culture uh, is to the world, for example. One is about uh, mathematics. So we know that uh, Mayan people uh, were, and I think uh, are still good in math. And, and here that there are only three symbols that are being used, for example, to represent the different numbers, for example, as you see in the right uh, part or, uh, of this slide, for example. You see the zero, the shell shape, and then one for one dot, and then the bar for five. As I mentioned before, the system is 20 by 20, for example. And then uh, one thing that it's important to mention here is the concept that people have about the zero, for example. So in other cultures, for example, zero means nothing, 
but here the syrup means like seed or the beginning of life. And so that's basically the idea that I want to discuss here. And then uh, in when you have 39, for example, basic group that I'm showing there is that you have the dot, which has the value of 20. So then you have 20 and then down below you have third, uh, uh, 19, for example. So it was, you have 39, for example. So you have the, uh, one in the, second level, for example, you have uh, 20, and then the one below, you have one. Okay, in the following slide, I have uh, some information about the astronomy and the calendar. And it's interesting to mention that um, Mayan uh, people uh, were the ones who uh, work hard in order to have an exact calendar, for example. So they knew, for example, a year was more than 365 days, for example. So therefore their calculation was like exact, like 365, not 24, 20, for example. And there are, uh, I mean, for the understanding of these uh, calendars, there are three types of calendars, for example, there is the one that is called the spiritual one that is connected with the uh, human being, for example, and then the solar calendar and the long count, basically. So I'm not going to discuss more about this, given the fact that I'm not an expert, but I'm just saying that these are the contribution of the Mayan people to the uh, humanity. In the next slide, I have the writing system. So this is the uh, Mayan glyphs that Mayan people uh, invented in order to write. And this is a way of using pictures or symbols to represent sounds, words, or sil syllables, for example. And it's the most comprehensive, comprehensive writing system that is found in Mesoamerica. In the following slide, I have, um, next slide, please. So here, uh, the other thing that it's important to mention is the Mayan ball game. So uh, this is well known also in Mesoamerica, but uh, also in, in, in Mayan culture. And I want to mention that uh, there is this, uh, I would say a revitalization of the, the Mayan ball game in Guatemala, for example. So it is being organized by people there in Guatemala to be in different championships. And last month, for example, there was a championship with, among different uh, uh, Mayan uh, players and who had the championship and then they are getting ready to a uh, championship game in, in Mexico, for example. So. I don't know more about that, but that's just something I want to mention. But again, I want to emphasize that this is a way of revitalizing not only the language, but at the same time, the culture. In the next, next slide, please. The other thing to mention here is uh, chocolate. So the cacao is was the uh, Mayan people were the first one to discover discover how to use cacao, for example. So how to combine or mix these different, uh, I mean, the beans and have the chocolate drink, for example. But the other thing is that the cacao, as we know from our uh, classes in history, for example, is that this was used as a currency among people at that time, for example, or during the time. In the next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, so. In addition to what we, I have talked about their contribution, for example, maybe not in the past, but I mean, it's a past that people know a little bit or other people have specialized about those uh, different uh, uh, parts of science, for example, math and astronomy and things like that. But it's important to mention also the contribution to Mayan communities to the uh, development, for example. In this case, I would like to talk a little bit about their art, as you're going to see in the following slide. So here we have this uh, Mayan textile. So one thing to mention here is that people, uh, 
especially uh, women, are really skilled in terms of uh, weaving, for example, and making their own clothing. Yeah, so they uh, make their own uh, clothing, for example. Of course, some of them buy their own, but this is really important. That's one way to uh, uh, making the culture alive, but the same, at the same time, making the people like uh, uh, with, I mean, showing the way of how people live with or their own uh, uh, way of using their cloth, for example. In the next slide, I would like to talk about uh, this instrument. So this is uh, the marimba, it's a musical instrument. And because I am from originally from Holom Konop, Sante Ulalia, I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the marimba and also talk a little uh, bit about two main things here. One, as you will see in the following slide, is that there are uh, marimba players in Sante Eulalia or in the Anhobal area. So I would, but I would say uh, mostly in Sante Eulalia, there are many groups of marimba players, but at the same time, uh, people who have uh, make marimbas. So I have here in this uh, slide, two pictures of two uh, uh, elders, uh, Juan Antonio or Juan Antun and uh, Pascual Mateo. They are the ones who have been uh, making marimbas for those different uh, uh, marimba players, but at the same times are the ones who are passing on that knowledge about, to their children, for example, about how to make marimbas, for example, uh, uh, in Guatemala. So one thing that, the other thing that I want to highlight here is that this is a really contribution to art, for example, but at the same time, it's a contribution not only at the local level, for example. So one of them, for example, uh, is, um, is the one who has exported his marimba to different places in the world. And recently, for example, when I moved to Canada, his, I mean, Don Pascual Mateo, for example, his son helped me to uh, send a marimba to Canada. So in the left side of myself now, I have my marimba sitting, for example, thanks to, uh, to his son. So in the following slide, I would like to talk about the situation of Guatemala. I mean, one thing that people really talk about Guatemala is that it's a country that it's labeled as multilingual and pluricultural uh, uh, country. Unfortunately, this is, and I want to say this, this is a uh, known or people talk about this more like uh, from a touristic uh, point of view. But if we really want you to talk about the contribution of these uh, languages or these cultures to Guatemala in general, I think, not I think, but here, this where we can talk about injustice going on in Guatemala. So one is that the majority of the population of Guatemala, for example, is indigenous. It's more than 60% of the population that includes Maya, Garifona, and Chinka. So therefore, if we hear this word, this expression or this phrase, multilingual and pluricultural country, it's true, right? Unfortunately, Spanish is the only language that is recognized as the official language in the country. So then the question is, what happens to the other languages? Aren't, I mean, aren't there, aren't these languages? So I think I'll just ask that question there and I'm going to uh, go to the next slide. One thing that it's important to highlight here is the civil war that took place in, in Guatemala. So during the civil war, uh, we can see that there is a lot of, I mean, uh, it was clear to see exclusion and discrimination against of Mayan people because, because of the following reasons. One is that 83% or more than 80% of the victims were Mayan people. So that means then that there was genocide committed against Mayan people, even though some people will say, well, there was no such thing. But I think this is really clear 
uh, from from what I'm just uh, telling, and also from what I have like uh, uh, experienced when I was a kid during the Civil War, for example. It's also interesting to mention that after the peace agreement with, between URNG and the Guatemalan government, for example, peop Mayan people, for example, to continue living in inequality or injustice, injustice, for example, proper education, for example. So there is a education is an being assimilated, for example, in their cultural language, for example, in the case in this case, Spanish being imposed as the language, for example, health centers, for example. So those are kind of things that, among of them, for example, the ones that are not, uh, I mean, that is missing from these days after that peace agreement, for example. The other thing that's important to mention is that nowadays, many Mayan speakers or indigenous, for example, who are in defense of mother nature, for example, or who are against of uh, injustice, uh, against to uh, Mayan people, for example, or indigenous people in general are considered or criminals by the Guatemalan government, which is unfortunate. In the next slide, I would like to try to uh, stop here and cl conclude with the following idea that despite of discrimination, racism, and as we see in the civil war, for example, Mayan Many Mayan people or Mayan people exist and have maintained their cultural identity. They have maintained their languages, they have maintained their culture, their community values, and their spirituality. So I think then when we talk about uh, Mayan day, I don't think it's just about one day. It's every day that we have to not only think about those Mayan people, but how to work with those Mayan people. And it doesn't matter where they are. Thank you. You well, Tiosh Ayer. Thank you so much, Pedro. That was really powerful. And um, I think some of the parts that you touched on that had more to do with culture really intersect with uh, a, an exhibition that we have up on view until November 7th called Translations and Transitions or Traducciones y Transiciones, a celebration of Mexican and Central American independence, 1821 to 2021, which really tries to get at the same idea that these are very much living languages. These are very much living cultures. Uh, the other themes, some of which you've touched on, have to do with chocolate, astronomy, mapping, um, knowledge of animals and, and deities. So thank you so much. And thank you for your very powerful um, statement in favor of indigenous peoples uh, that you touched on at the end. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's a privilege to be speaking after Pedro. And I want to thank Pedro for introducing me to Guatemala. I started there about 10 years ago. And um, it's been wonderful working together, uh, preserving Mayan languages and helping their speakers. As you could see from the presentation and also from some remarks that Ellen made, language is central to pretty much every human endeavor. It's central to culture, it's central to natural uh, knowledge, to knowledge of uh, traditional medicine, to knowledge of traditional customs and rituals. And so wherever you go, you really need to uh, start with language. It's the hub that everything else is organized uh, around. And this is the central idea which underscored and underlies the concept of the Guatemala Field Station that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But first, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of the richness of Mayan languages, which we're going to see in the next slide. So the Mayan language family has about 30 different languages. And uh, Although people often think, okay, Mayan culture, Mayan speakers, there are about there are so many different groups, and they don't always understand each other. Proto Mayan, the common ancestor of these languages, which you're going to see in a map in a few moments, uh, started about 4,000 years ago, and right now there are about five million people all over Central America, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, who speak Mayan languages. There are some very large ones, Quiche and Yucatec. 
And then there are tiny languages like Itzah, where there are only 37 speakers and linguists are working really hard to preserve it before those 37 speakers disappear. So let's take a look at the map and some photos in the next slide. So this is just a map of Mayan languages. And if you look at the font size, that gives you the idea of how many speakers there are. So you can see Yucatec at the top of the map as a large language. And then if you squint, you're going to see some very tiny languages, which means that there are very few speakers. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to see some beautiful pictures, um, which are pictures taken in Guatemala. And I want to call your attention to the one in the bottom left, Soloma which is considered the historical homeland of Mayan people and Mayan languages. This is where it all started about 4,000 years ago. And hopefully when the pandemic subsides, many of you will be able to travel and see this natural beauty to yourselves. So let's go on. And uh, here we again see another map, which basically gives you the distribution of different Mayan languages in Mexico and Guatemala. And in the next slide, I'm going to talk about this distribution a little bit. So there are a lot of Mayan languages. Some are spoken in the southern part of Mexico, but there are also quite a few Mayan languages around us, in particular in Maryland. So the rest of Maryland is in College Park. And there is an area nearby called Langley Park. And where you go, you hear a lot of Spanish, but you also hear a lot of Mayan languages. There is a very large Cacchiquel community in Illinois. There are a lot of Conjobal speakers in California. So uh, it's exotic, but at the same time, there are Mayan immigrants among us. And it's our job and our duty to preserve their language, at the same time helping them and their children learn new languages. So let's move on. Uh, uh, when you talk about Mayan languages, you probably think of old writing systems, which was um, which were very beautiful. You saw some pictures in Pedro's slides, and uh, these systems were a real puzzle for people who worked in them. There was this classic Maya, there's Yucatecan Maya, which is um, more or less described, and there are a lot of researchers working in Yucatec. Some other points of interest include the uh, system of counting based on 20, which Pedro has shown. And uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, we're now going to talk about what we can do about Mayan languages and the um, mission of the Guatemala Field Station that I'm the head of. One of the crucial things about the Field Station is that you cannot just go into a community and say, I'm going to preserve your language. I'm going to help you. You only go where people want to be helped. And uh, so what makes me very proud is that the Guatemala Field Station is an example of the work which can be done jointly by the community and outside researchers. We went to Guatemala because we were asked to go there, not because we just wanted to go there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the reason Guatemala is so attractive to linguists is that it has this incredible linguistic richness. Aside from Mayan languages, as Pedro mentioned, there's also Xinca and Garifuna. There are different varieties of Spanish. But the important thing is that because of this um, very tragic, very catastrophic history, Guatemala has developed a strong pattern of indigenous activism and interest in working with American researchers and non-government organizations. So when we went to Guatemala, we knew that we're going there because the community wants to see us there. And so we established the field station, which you're going to see on the next slide. And it's basically a, an infrastructure which is present in the community. And one of the most important aspects of the field station is that researchers who work there have access to the community, but they also enjoy the trust of that community and they have an enormous responsibility to the community. So some of the projects we've done um, include the teaching of mathematics using Cacchiquil, not teaching mathematics in Spanish, uh, describing traditional medicine, describing some traditional cooking recipes, something that I will come back to. But so if we think about work that linguists or anthropologists do, we always know that the first few weeks or months are spent solving logistical problems, where I'm going to live, who I'm going to work with, am I needed here? All these connections, all these questions are actually present in the Guatemala Field Station, which allows us to 
conduct research and work with the community from the very first day when we arrived in Guatemala. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a picture. You'll see a couple of photos of various American researchers working um, together and working with Guatemalan researchers. And they're all working at the field station where they're given access, infrastructure, and connection to the community. Next slide. So um, we've now done seven years of work. And um, although the pandemic actually dealt a blow to some of the endeavors, I'm very proud that we were able to continue during the pandemic. Over the last year, we've done three online courses in Kakchikil and Kiche with students from all over the world. And so what we do is we partner with a nonprofit group, Wukukawok, which deals with indigenous healthcare and work on issues of language, migration, nutrition, which is extremely important. And we help different local collectives in business development. Next slide, please. So um, Guatemala Fold Station and Wukukawuk have been working with community members during COVID and beyond COVID. And so what we do is we help develop language applications so that researchers who do deal with healthcare and nutrition could go into rural areas where people don't speak much Spanish and could actually explain what's going on using Kakchikel, one of the man mind languages. So if you want to talk to a young mother and tell her what the best nutrition is for her baby, you want to be able to speak Kakchikel. And your Kakchikel may not be perfect, but you need to know the right words. A lot of people might have high blood pressure. And if someone doesn't speak Spanish or speaks very little Spanish, you need to know words in Kakchikel in order to explain what high blood pressure means and how to work against high blood pressure. And so this is this partnership between people who do very abstract linguistic research and people who work on the ground trying to help local communities. Next slide, please. So um, as I just said, the incoming researcher can arrive at the field station and hit the ground running, and there is no separation between the researcher and the community. And the way that's achieved is that all our researchers actually live in host families. So we're going to see that in the next slide. So not only are you surrounded by the language, but you're also uh, uh, you're teaching, you're uh, being taught the language in class. So in this picture, you can see several of us. And um, the person who is standing, that's our teacher, Senor Filiberto. I'm sitting in the right hand corner. I was the worst student in the class. But even I learned something and it was a fantastic class. We studied from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night. But then you go home to the home where you're staying, next slide, and you're again surrounded by the language. And then you can also work with the local researchers. So in these photos, you see some of our students working with the local native speaker linguists, Mayan Guatemalan linguists, who also want to study and preserve their own languages. So this is this collaboration with the local researchers and work with the community. Next slide. Uh, at the end of the program, which we run, um, which we ran before pandemic, we had um, a presentation at the local university, at the Universidad de La Valle, where we had presentations both by the local researchers and by the American researchers. And again, there is this collaboration working on different languages and a number of workshops for local teachers who want to know what better, me better methods to use in order to teach the Mayan languages. Next slide. So this is just to reiterate that there is no no daylight between the researcher and the community. And in the next slide, you will see some of the pictures um, where you can see um, on the left, our local group, which our sorry, research group, which arrived in um, Patsun, which used to be the uh, capital of the Kaktikil Kingdom. That's where the field station is. And so here they're participating in the decoration of the street with very intricate ornaments. On the right, you see a host family welcoming one of our researchers. So this person was not only exposed to Kaktikil eight to five every day, but he was also learning Kaktikil and he was living in the host family. And of course, we try to select our researchers in a very careful way so that not only do they learn from the community, but they also represent us in the best way possible. I want to conclude by talking about one particular project, which is on the next slide. 
and that is the oral history project that we're involved with. This is the project Women Talking. So um, a couple of researchers interviewed Kakchikel women from Patsun, and these women whose age ranges ran from 20 to 60 or 65, shared their life stories. As you can imagine, older women were actually willing to talk about the Civil War. And this is another unwritten chapter in Guatemalan history, what happened to women in Civil War. Usually people talk about soldiers, but this was the story of hardship, the story of loss. Um, they talked about lighter subjects like popular medicinal knowledge. They shared their cooking recipes. And right now they have a large corpus which has been transcribed in Kakchika and we're preparing the text in Spanish and English. So hopefully, although it's slow going, with the help of the community, we're gonna have a book which will represent the uh, women of Patsum, the cooperative women of Patsum, and we're very grateful to these women. A lot of that work was actually done as these women were sitting there and doing their beautiful embroidery, which you see in this picture. So uh, this is just a snapshot of what we've been doing at the Guatemala Field Station, but I hope that this will give you a little bit of an idea, and it's my sincere hope that once the pandemic is over, we could actually welcome some of you in Guatemala, and we're always happy to see new researchers at the field station. So thank you very much. Um, let's just hope that the pandemic will be over and we will be able to conduct our research back in situ. But in the meantime, we're continuing with our classes. So Pedro and I, as I said, have run Kakchikil and Kiche classes online and we're planning several more. So um, thanks again for inviting us. It's been a privilege and Hopefully, if there are any questions, Pedro and I can answer them. Great. So yes, we'll we'll open up. Um, there is anybody can go ahead and put questions and comments into the chat. Um, it looks like we already had some more like saludos from some people from Muriel uh, Louveau, Marie Francoise Los Losano, Mario Mutis, and Nahid Navab um, sending thanks and sending looks like hellos. So I don't know if those are friends, family, colleagues of yours, but exciting to, to see that. Um, well, I'm going to kick things off um, before we get other questions with um, the big question, I think, uh, that we all grapple with, you know, what, what for you is the value of speaking and learning Indigenous languages in the 21st century? What do, what do we lose when some of these languages or variants of languages uh, go extinct? What, what do we lose as a, as a part of humanity? Oh, Pedro, you want to go first or should I? Sure. That's okay. a big question. So I. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, one is that, uh, as you mentioned, as we mentioned, language and culture go hand by hand. And when a language disappears, a culture also disappears. Mm. But as linguists, for example, when a language disappears, there's a linguistic knowledge that is gone. And so that's be that's going to be a challenge when we talk about languages, for example, and when we want to uh, discuss uh, different uh, ideas about linguistics, for example. So that's going to be one thing. But as for community members, let's say, uh, the language being gone and the culture, it's like uh, not having your own identity. So for people then of those communities, having a language or having a culture is an, it's an important aspect of their lives. That will be um, my answer to that. Yeah, I was, um, when I first went to Guatemala, my assumption was that when language disappears, culture goes away, just like Pedro said. And that's something that every linguist would acknowledge be that a linguist who just sits in their armchair or a linguist who travels. But when I went to Guatemala, I discovered another very important element of the uh, maintenance of na native languages, and that is the connection between generations. So you cannot really have a um, meaningful connection between, let's say, a grandparent and a grandchild without them sharing a particular language. And I've seen sort of both sides of that because it's not a secret that in urban setting, mind languages are 
becoming more and more extinct, extinct. They disappear under the influence of Spanish. And you hear a lot of older people who say quite bitterly, I wish I could speak to my grandson, but I don't think he'll understand. I have so many things to tell him. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you have those little grandkids, 8, 10, 12 years of age, and they say, well, my grandma doesn't speak any Spanish. I don't want to talk to her. And then when they grow up at age 20, 25, it's a little too late, and they realize, okay, I lost my connection to the previous generation. So it's not just identity. It's also the transmission of generations, mm -hmm. and that's particularly important. And of course, in addition to that, there's all this traditional knowledge. Uh, we gave you a couple of examples today. One is the system of counting based on 20. Uh, if we look at that system, it's very rich, it's very interesting, it's very unusual. Once Mayan languages are extinct, we wouldn't know much about the way Mayan, the old Mayans count them. Mm -hmm. Other things have to do with names of traditional herbs. Um, most mm, Americans, most gringos, when they get to Guatemala, get sick. And I was no exception, so I got very sick because, you know, you're not used to the water. And my host mom uh, started giving me some tea and I asked her what it is and she said oh you won't understand and then she gave me a bunch of words in Kachikel which I dutifully wrote down and turned out it was a couple of herbs which we don't have and a lot of garlic and so now at least I understand what the traditional medicine is which uh, Mayan women use to treat their family to treat their children and again this is very important so there are all these little tangible and intangible things which probably can be agglomerated under the name of culture. But again, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, language as a link between generations. Wow, that's so powerful. I feel like that's something that um, so many people can relate to, especially in the United States about, um, you know, we often... Uh, lionize our our, our um, immigrant ancestors, or you know, it may have been very recent, but sometimes we don't always get that that link to them passed down. We don't we don't get that language. So that's okay. that's something really powerful. Um, something that I think a lot of people are grappling with today. Absolutely. I th I see we have a question from Mario Mutis in the questions, um, who asks: Has there been a push toward forward towards the written element of the Mayan langu language? And I think you're asking about how to transliterate, how to, how to, um, you know, we heard me saying inarticulately Canjobal, and then we heard Pedro actually saying the name of that um, language much more correctly. And right now, what are the tools to indicate pronunciation? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, has there been a push forward towards the written element of Mayan language for um, all variants or have you seen this? Are so, people, um, yeah. Um, actually, if you look at look back at the map we showed you, the larger languages do have a writing system. It's based on the Latin alphabet with a lot of mm -hmm. apostrophes, which mean adjectives. And uh, if you go to any bookstore, libreria in Guatemala, you do find publications in Kakchikil, in Quiche, in Yucatan. The problem is that Although there are these uh, written sources, there are Bibles, there are grammars, um, some publications are uh, created as we speak, uh, not every Mayan speaker can actually read. And that goes back to this issue of economic inequality and lack of access to education that Pedro mm -hmm. brought up. So a lot of Mayan speakers, especially in rural areas, are denied good quality education. If they go to school, they just go for a few years, they learn a little bit of Spanish. And because of those economic conditions and the inequality, the tradition of reading in Mayan languages is not very well promoted. Before the internet, there was this wonderful tradition of the Mayan radio. And um, a number of Guatemalan researchers and our American colleagues collected a lot of stories from different speakers in different languages, and those things were broadcast over the radio. Right now, there is, of course, a uh, possibility of uh, broadcasting things on the internet. The internet is making slow um, grounds in uh, Guatemalan society. And when we were there, we're actually working with one of the local enthusiasts, creating a couple of phone apps so that we could actually promote literacy in mind language. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Mario, a short answer to your question is yes, but the longer version is it's slow, it's been, you know, uh, fitful, it's not been very smooth, but it's still a very important path to cover. I don't know if Pedro would like to add something to that. Yeah, thank you, Mario, for your question. Uh, I would say that there are uh, efforts about uh, writing, for example, in in Mayan languages. I will say that there are local efforts, individual efforts uh, in the Mayan communities, for example. There are also uh, institutional efforts uh, for writing and reading in these languages. So, um, for in Guatemala, for example, we have. Academia, La Academia de las Lenguas Mayas de Guatemala, ALMG. Uh, there is also DIGEVI, Dirección General de Educación Bilingüe of the Ministry of Education, where uh, children are expected to be uh, taught in their uh, Mayan language, for example. As for Mexico, there is INALI, for example, uh, that works with indigenous languages of Mexico, for example, which includes uh, Mayan languages. And as a matter of fact, uh, ILMG and INALI are the institutions that are like, that work on the uh, research preservation uh, of indigenous languages, for example. So I think there, there are uh, efforts, of course, as Masha said, uh, those are really like, uh, it's a, slow process, but people are uh, uh, doing uh, something in order to have a written version of the Mayan language. And there is a, as, as for alphabet, for example, for uh, there is this alphabet, that uh, unified alphabet that was created for Mayan languages, for example. Yeah. Thank you. And um, this project that I was telling you about, oral histories, one of the main goals is that it's going to be trilingual, be Cochicale, Spanish, and English. And for us, it's really important to have Cochicale texts. Well, that is great. I, I, it makes me think about Mexico and many um, archaeological sites will have at least bilingual um, labeling with the local indigenous language and Spanish. In some cases, I'm, I'm aware of this for Monte Alban in, in Oaxaca and in the, in the south of Mexico and some other, um, I believe that there's Yucatec labeling for um, many of the Maya sites as well. So um, there's this push towards it, but so still moving slowly. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for what an interesting question. Very thoughtful question. Um, I wonder if we can turn to something super practical for a moment. Um, you know, I remember hearing a lot that many people, a lot of parents believe that learning two languages as a child, um, so they worry about maybe teaching Mayan languages to their children because maybe it makes it harder to learn one um, perfectly effectively. Or um, So that may be a reason that migrant parents might not teach their children the languages that they grew up with. Um, what does your research show uh, in linguistics? Does learning two languages as a child, uh, does that cause any problems or is that actually really helpful for children? Pedro, oh, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think learning more than two languages is a problem. Uh, there is this uh, idea that each person at least can learn about seven different languages. <laughs> so if you speak two languages, then you are in a, I mean, a good way to reach those seven languages, for example. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, I think, as, as in the case of Guatemala and based on my experience, for example, is that we don't have the culture of learning more than one language. And I don't think it's just a case of Guatemala, but in other cases where the uh, rule is like speaking one language. But I don't think that's the case when we live in uh, a country, as I mentioned in my slides, where we have different languages. So at least everybody, I mean, 
has to be bilingual, at least Spanish and a Mayan language, for example, and do more than that, for example. So there are people who are promoting, for example, learning when we when people talk about language revitalization, for example, like how to bring a language back. But then other people say, well, how can we learn several indigenous languages? So what I'm trying to say then is that it's uh, it's it's false. It is false to say that having one language and learning one is going to be a problem. No, the more languages, the better, because knowing, I mean, for example, there are research that has shown that bilingual brains are better at multitasking, for example, doing a better job. So I think uh, if we think about uh, learning more languages, it's uh, going to be more benefit than having some negative impacts in our lives, for example. Um, until maybe the 1990s, it was considered a dogma that you have to learn one language and then you add the other one or the next one. And so that was associated with this idea that certain languages are just more practical when you have to go to school to learn math. And this was seen all over the world in various uh, multilingual societies where parents were thinking, OK, language X is associated with upward mobility. Starting with the 1990s, there's been a lot of research which shows what Pedro just mentioned, and that is that bilinguals are better at certain cognitive tasks. But when we say bilingual, we mean someone who acquired both languages before age five or six. So it's really critical that the parents teach their, lang uh, their languages or different languages to their kids as early as possible. There is no evidence that this has any detrimental effect on their education later in life. And there is some evidence which is being debated whether or not this actually has some positive repercussions. So there is some research which shows that early bilinguals actually uh, develop less Alzheimer's than people who grew up monolingual. So when this research was published in the early 2000s, everybody started suddenly learning new languages. But, you know, it's a little too late. You have to start before age five. Uh, but definitely bilingualism is good. And one of the missions in the field station is to educate the locals in the importance of their languages. So mm -hmm. Pedro is too modest to mention that, but he has held a lot of workshops for the local communities telling them, please teach their, your kids, not just Spanish, but the local languages, because that's really important. And so I think, um, if we continue, I, I'm not saying that the field station is going to solve all the problems, but we, if we all as a society continue promoting this idea that every language is important and all languages are equal in the mind of the bilingual, they definitely are, we can actually achieve meaningful results. Mm. That's really inspiring to hear. I love, I think we'll take that away as a quote. The more languages, the better, and we can actually achieve meaningful results by promoting these languages. That's really that's really exciting to hear. Well, I think we're we're almost ready to wrap this up. Um, I don't see any more questions right now in the comments, um, but uh, I really have enjoyed speaking with you. I feel like we could talk for much longer, and I'd ha I actually have a lot more questions. Um, in just a word, in just a few words, what is the best part of teaching languages for you? Oh, well, it looks like Mario has. Hmm. Okay, this is a very practical question and probably very quick. We'll let Mario Mutis have the last question. Mm -hmm. He asks, do you suggest any online sources to learn any type of Mayan language? Oh, there are multiple sources. I think we'll take an hour to list them all. Pedro, um, can you think of the best ones? I mean, there's a very good program at the University of Kansas where Pedro got his PhD. Mm -hmm. They have wonderful Kafchikil program. Um, is, it, is it online? If you were not yeah 
Uh, right now, everything is online. <laughs> um, Pedro, anything else? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. So there are different, uh, for example, websites that talk about uh, languages, document language documentation, for example, or learning languages, for example. So this is a really interesting website from the uh, University of Texas at Austin, where there are different lessons on Kiche. It's a uh, it's everything on online, for example. Uh, so that will be a good uh, uh, information to look at. But in addition to that, I think this, I will uh, take this opportunity to kind of to talk about our field schools that we are coordinating between the University of Maryland and University of Toronto, for example, where we uh, bring uh, different students to learn Mayan languages, for example. So that's another possibility for example. But uh, if Mario, if you're interested on a specific language, it will be good to, uh, if you can send us your email or something, we can uh, then later send you the links about the different uh, languages that you can find information about. Terrific. And there are links for the, the Guatemala field station in the chat, um, which will be there for anybody who's looking for that. And I believe that would also lead you to at least uh, Masha's email address, if not both of your email addresses. Um, so if you have that question about online resources, but it's been such a pleasure to speak with you tonight. And I look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Mathieu.